And before I talk to you about quantum computers, I want to teach you what the acronym QCD means. That means quantum computing and devices, and that is the name of my research group at Alto. When I talk about these results, I couldn't just resist to show all the people from all years. So this is the, all the group photos we've done so far. Um, and I'm very happy that even some people in the first group photo are here and we are still working with, with them. So uh, that's great. And as you can see, during the years, uh, we have I had to squeeze the photos because it gets wider and wider and we are in three rows now. OK, so these amazing people, um, during their work at QCD, they published a lot of papers. And now I'm going to go eat to, through each one of them one by one. Just kidding. If you're interested in these papers, I have a nice book for you to read. It's called What It Takes to Become an Associate Professor, Volume 1 and 2. So <laughs> many of these papers are here, uh, all of the ones that I'm authoring as well. This is the first book that I authored without knowing it before it was published. Well, just one copy of it. All right, so I also like to thank the Quantum Computer Working Group, and also the same uh, PIs are in the Center of Excellence that Matti mentioned. So I'd like to thank these people and the groups uh, for collaborating with these results. OK, let's talk about quantum computers and quantum computing. In very simple terms, quantum computing is a kind of a problem solver, uh, right? So you have an input, your classical problem, and you want a classical answer out. Uh, but what happens in between from the input to the output, that's the actual quantum mechanics, uh, quantum computing, that can't be done with a classical computer. It could, for example, happen inside a superconducting chip, like this, what we have fabricated at Alto. Um, the point here in a quantum computer or quantum computing is not that the processor ticks faster than the classical processor. In fact, each operation is much slower than a classical processor. But the point is that because of this quantum decrease of freedom, this high dimensional space that you have access to, uh, you can take shortcuts in the computation. So you need much less computational steps uh, than in a classical computer. So what are these high dimensions? Um, let's take an example of a single quantum bit qubit. It has two basis states called 0 and 1, and these are kind of the states that classical computer can access. However, something called a quantum superposition is possible, which means that the system can be simultaneously in these two states. And these can be described by the arrow here on a sphere. So each point on the three-dimensional sphere corresponds to a single different quantum state. Um, so you have two variables defining this sphere, which means that if you represent each variable with a double uh, floating point number, you need 16 bytes of memory in a classical computer uh, to represent the quantum state. So what about, well, that's, that's very easy, like 16 bytes, piece of cake. Uh, what about two qubits? In two qubits, actually, it turns out to have six variables. So that's a seven-dimensional sphere. I don't know how to draw it here on, on the two-dimensional plane. Uh, but instead, you can represent it like this. So this is kind of the sum of all the classical states. And these coefficients here are the ones that you need to know to actually know the quantum state. So here you would need 48 bytes to represent the state. Still very easy for a classical computer. What about if you have 1,000 qubits, you actually have an insane number of decrease of freedom, insane number of bytes, you can never put a state like this into a classical computer memory because there are even fewer particles in the universe that you would need uh, bytes here. So that really shows in principle or in theory that quantum computers can do something that classical computers can never do. Whether that something becomes reality and useful, we, we will see. All right. So we were talking about quantum computers being faster than classical computers because they take the shortcuts. But is that the only way quantum computers can be useful? The answer is no. Quantum speed up actually means, or sorry, quantum advantage means that the quantum computers can be faster, it can be cheaper, or more accurate than classical computers. For example, if you are doing risk analysis in finance, if you have a better, more accurate prediction, I think that is worth a lot of money even if it comes at the same pr price and time. Um, so, however, we are not at the quantum advantage sta stage yet uh, globally, but 
what was well predicted before quantum advantage was something called quantum supremacy. And the very good news is that last week, uh, Google reported in this paper the achievement of quantum supremacy. Quantum supremacy means that quantum computers are faster than any classical computer in a reasonable computational task. Preferably a task that when the size of the problem uh, grows, the speed up is going to be exponentially increased with respect to classical computers. So this is a fight. A computer fights against a computer over power. And that's why I thought there's a great analogy for this Russell, Charles Russell's uh, picture of, uh, for supremacy. Um, it's a different kind of power and different kind of uh, instances fighting, but still. Um, but eventually quantum computers are thought to win this fight because, uh, because of the uh, scaling that is different. But by definition, the quantum supremacy doesn't need to be useful. We just talked about quantum advantage, quantum supremacy. It's a different thing. It is, by definition, not need to be useful, um, and, but it is faster. The quantum computer is faster here. But one of the problems here is that um, if classical computer can't solve this task, how to check that it actually quantum computer gives you the right answer? And this is not obvious, um, but I think the next big milestone in quantum supremacy is actually to show um, quantum supremacy in a problem that can be classically checked easily. The classical computer can't solve the problem, but once you have the solution, you could check whether it's right or wrong. So I hope very soon uh, we will achieve this kind of milestone. So now I'm turning a little bit to more local um, results. And I want to show the quantum computing and devices labs. This is how it looks like. Uh, we have uh, three dilution refrigerators made uh, here in Finland uh, by Blue Force. And if you open the can, the white can, you will see something shiny golden inside. And at the bottom plate, the temperature goes with the press of a button to one hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. So very, very cold. And these, uh, we install our chips here and we control those with the electronics that you can see here. So the qubits are put here on a sample stage that you can see, for example, here. And, we, and here's a superconducting chip that we have fabricated with six qubits as uh, marked as the crosses. If you now zoom in into one of the qubits, you will see the structure. It's this kind of X-Man style uh, qubit, um, which works basically as a capacitor. So the current is flowing through these tiny tunnel junctions here that you can't really see in the picture into the capacitor plate and back. And that kind of oscillation of the f electricity in the system corresponds to the state zero and one in the qubit. And you can control the qubit with the drive line. So you can drive with the microwaves in resonance with the qubit transition frequency. And, and then you can rotate the system between zero and one. And in this figure, you can see that we can also control the frequency of the qubit. So what is the energy splitting between zero and one with a magnetic flux as it should be doable? So, so this shows that we can fabricate reasonable qubits in the lab, and we can also measure the lifetime, which is the a time that it takes for the quantum information to be destroyed by itself. Uh, something that you would not want to happen, but it happens eventually. And in this experiment, for example, the lifetime was between 10 and 50 microseconds, which is a good number uh, in, in the field. So now I want to go a little bit more deeper into two different results um, that we have achieved uh, uh, or published this year. Uh, we have been focusing a lot on the engineering of dissipation in the circuits so that you, you don't only want to get rid of the dissipation all the time, but at some point in, the, in the solving the problems, you may want to introduce dissipation controllably into the circuit. For example, in resetting qubits. And then I'm going to, uh, going to also talk about qubit readout, so how to read the quantum information very fast. In fact, I will first go into this topic here. So this is the same picture that you saw uh, previously. We have the drive one and the readout resonator. But now I'm going to describe how to use this readout resonator to read out this quantum state of the qubit. So we apply a microwave tone here. Uh, so this is actually, now I first described it, described the usual way of measuring the qubit, so-called dispersive readout. So we apply a microwave tone here, and the readout resonator, it's, it's, it's close to the resonance of the readout resonator. And, and depending on the qubit state, ground state, or the excited state, uh, there will be a phase shift into the tone that is going to be transmitted through this uh, line. 
And then if you see, look at the quantum state as a function of the time that you measure uh, after, after at here at room temperature, first you start with, a, with the, in, in the origin, which means that there is no photons in the resonator. And once the resonator gets populated, these two states, they separate. So each color, again, de denotes the different state. So if the qubit is in the ground state, this is the average path. And if the qubit is in the excited state, this is the average path. And you, of course, want these states to separate as fast as possible and as far away as possible to be able to then to read out the system in the end. Each of these dots corresponds to a single shot experiment. So you can see that we can make fairly good uh, readout with this um, technique as well. Well, instead of what we did, uh, uh, a new thing is that we apply a drive, uh, microwave drive pulse to both the qubit and the readout resonator. And by tuning carefully the phase and the amplitude of this drive, we can actually make the states to separate immediately vertically. So, so when we did this, we, we could measure the error, readout error as a function of the time it takes for the readout the qubit, and we can see that the readout is much faster in this, in this case. And, and, and we think that we can also optimize this uh, later on. So now with the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about the quantum circuit refrigerator. That is, uh, a schematic is shown here, where you have the qubit and the readout resonator, now shown a little bit in a different scheme, but this, you can imagine that they, on, on the chip they look like as before. And you can now couple a, a pair of tunnel junctions to the readout resonator, for example. And the way the re refrigerator works is that you can tune the voltage between this, uh, across these junctions to turn on and off the refrigerator. As a function of the voltage now, I will, I'm, I'm showing the dissipation rate at the resonator induced by the QCR. So if we are at zero volts, the, the, the uh, dissipation rate is very low. This corresponds to lifetimes of more than 100 microseconds. And when you increase the uh, voltage, you can make the qubit to dissipate very, or the resonator to dissipate very fast. So the idea in the qubit reset would be that you start with zero volts, and once you want to reset the qubit, before the computation, for example, you pulse the voltage quickly here, you wait for something like 100 nanoseconds, and you pulse it back, so that you have a fresh qubit to start with. So does this work? This is, a, this is, this is real measurement data, but this is with a static voltage. What about if we pulse the voltage, does it work, work fast? Here I show you the population of the resonator as a function of time, start, starting from some population and then stopping the excitation so that we can wait for the resonator to ring down. Um, during the ring down, we apply a short pulse to the voltage, and we can see that during the pulse, there's a dramatic drop of the population, and after the pulse, you can still see slow decay. So this shows that we can turn on and off the uh, refrigerator very quickly in a, in a time scale of a couple of nanoseconds. All right, I think this was the last uh, data that I wanted to show you. And um, now I'm going to just show you one sample that we have been fabricating to couple these refrigerators with resonators. And also, you can couple it to the one arm of the qubit to reset the qubit directly if you want. And this is kind of the next, next results I'm hoping to see from the research group to pop out. OK, so I talked to you about these three papers that we published this year. And we have much more. And I want to thank all the group again and collaborators for this amazing year. And thank you for your attention.